So let me add my welcome. Um, again, Bob Powell from East Greensboro Rotary. And this is the most difficult introduction I've ever had to do. So I can introduce Bob Foxworth. He's been a friend for many years. Um, I first met him as part of Neighborhood United, which was a rotary function in the 1990s, building a million dollars worth of houses in East Greensboro. He was the executive director of that organization. And he has been, since that time, a constant uh, voice activist, purveyor of social justice in Greensboro and really um, getting, getting Greensboro out of Greensboro and in across the country. But somehow I've got to introduce two people because Bob's not here tonight. Huh? Um, <laughs> Mark Twain has shown up in his place. And uh, so the person I'm really supposed to introduce is Mark Twain. Um, like I say, how do you do that? So I, I may have to leave it to Mr. Twain to fill in the gaps here of where he was and how he came back and how he's here and so forth. Um, but let me ask him just one question before I bring him up. I want to make sure that we have his, uh, his, what? his approval yes. for everybody to feel free to have refreshments and, you know, while he's speaking. And I know he's from a more formal time, but this is kind of a casual... Um, if I can't hold a crowd through that, then I do, don't deserve to be here. Come on up. <laughs> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you have just heard, the name is Twain. Mark Twain, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Williams? Professor Williams, excuse me. Yes, right. Well, that's all my alter ego's name also, and I, he never shows up when I perform. I just really, really put out with that man. Anyway, well, uh, I, I would have to say that, that Professor Powell's uh, introduction was bordering on more than adequate since he talked about that other guy so much. I don't know whether I should continue or not, but I shall tell you a bit about myself throughout the day. And you already know he's, the, he's about to rise to the status of president of this august body. And I do congratulate him for that. Now normally, I, well not normally, but I do prefer to introduce myself. The reason is I can always, when I do that, make sure that I do introduce myself more than adequately. So, now, uh, I also wish to, to express my sincere appreciation for your appearance here this evening. Uh, despite uh, many of you having been forewarned against it, that's quite an accomplishment as always. It is always gratifying for me to find another enclave of adventuresome souls afoot in this present century. Now, it has become my custom to tour the country these days merely for the sake of holding forth for the sake of it. And no longer to, uh, to uh, garner reaction to my as yet unpublished work, for there is none, and shamelessly to promote my latest book. Now, I had two periods, two very uh, intensive and extensive periods of touring, both of which were unofficially and officially to bail myself out of financial difficulty. The first such tour took place between 1871 and 1872. Well, not so curiously coincidental with the building of my great mansion in Hartford, Connecticut, which I could not afford. <laughs> that I gave some 80 speeches and the proceeds from those speeches served to replenish my funds. The other 
much more extensive and intensive tour was my Grand World Tour, which took place between 1895 and 1898. This was to, this is where I sought to extricate myself from a condition of insolvency. Now, mind you, I was not bankrupt. Now, but truth needs to overrule that statement I, and tell you that it was a mere technicality owing to the fact that the word bankruptcy, Mr. Miles, was not as yet a part of the legal lexicon. Otherwise, I would have been indeed bankrupt. <laughs> now, I will tell you more about, about that story later. Now, I, I wish to uh, in, take the liberty to indulge in a bit of shameless commercialism and to promote my latest book. But curiously and unusually, not on my behalf, but on that of the Mark Twain Project and the University of California. Now, one might reasonably ask, why is this book so long in appearing? Well, simply put, because I caused a stipulation to be entered into my last will and testament that it should not be published for 100 years after my death. Now, I indeed passed from this veil. My departure took place on April 21st, 1910, just as I had made my arrival on November 30th, 1835 on the tale of Halley's Comet. Bye. Now, as to the creation of my autobiography, it would be improper to call it writing because beginning in January of 1906, I gave almost daily uh, uh, di autobiographical dictations to my stenographer, Mrs. Jennifer S. Hobby, who was also a good audience. Now, the uh, idea of randomly dictating an autobiography as opposed to to laboriously writing it out in chronological sequence was my innovation. Now, <clears throat> the way it worked, I would choose a subject and expound upon it until I grew tired of it, and then I would choose another subject and expound upon that until I got tired of it, and so forth and so on. And it, it occurs to me that it must have driven the final editors of this work to uh, to uh, distraction bordering upon insanity. But no matter, the reader can hear me speaking, and that is the level of intimacy I wish to achieve. <clears throat> As I mentioned my autobiography, I should say a word or two about the origin of my name. Those of you here, like, such as Ms. Boston, who have done extensive reading in my work and who are familiar with my background are aware that my given name is Samuel Langhorn Clements, a far cry from Mark Twain. In fact, Mark Twain's no name at all, but a sounding that indicates the Mississippi River is safe for a steamboat to travel in. By the Mark Twain! Want to make sure you weren't sleeping soundly. <laughs> that is cried out by the boat's leads man to indicate the second mark on the line. Two fathoms, or 12 feet, and therefore safe for a steamboat to travel in. Now there are those 
people who infer from a, a, a hidden meaning in my nom de plume that indicates I wish to travel in safe waters in my life. However, just briefest, the briefest of glances at my adventures, both geographically and financially, would, would, would smash that into smithereens, as they say. Indeed, I have, uh, I've had some adventures in my day. Also, it may interest you to know that in, I first employed my name, Mark Twain, in 1863 while working as a reporter on the Territorial Enterprise in, Vir in Virginia City, Nevada. I haven't broached the subject of commercialism. May I continue? Thank you. <laughs> Even before Libby, that's Olivia Langdon, and I were married in 1870, she had her sights set upon my becoming an Eastern gentleman. Can you fathom that? <laughs> and I set mine upon earning my fortune and hence to, uh, to work in, in the, um, the um, subscription publication industry to publish my books. Now for those of you who are not familiar with the subscription publication industry, this is a scheme in which, a, which salespeople travel to the hinterlands to secure advanced publications, paid of course, and to future, they, to secure it. <laughs> Foxworth's around here somewhere, I think. <laughs> to secure advanced subscriptions to future publications at a discounted price. This was while we were still living in Buffalo and I was working on the Buffalo Press. Actually, I was a part owner. That, I lost money on that one, too. <laughs> However, I was so successful in applying this scheme to sell my books that my very first book, written in Buffalo, entitled Innocence Abroad, sold in excess of 160,000 copies. Now, to compare that, established authors of the day were managing a mere few thousand, perhaps 5,000, using conventional publishing and distribution methods. I have taken the position that anything but subscription publication is printing for private circulation. However, lest I lose my hard-earned humility, perhaps we should move on to another subject. <laughs> Yes, yes. Whereas there's gracious plenty of material in my work to fund any conversation we might have, this one and, and any future conversation, I think it is incumbent upon me to comment from time to time on what I see in the 21st century. Take, for example, the phenomenon of self-storage. <laughs> Now, ever since my contemporary, Sigmund Freud, uh, espoused and developed the psychological concept of self, it's obvious that it has deteriorated and devolved into a, <laughs> into a sorry state indeed. Or, perhaps, the mere passage of time has just identified the self for what it always was. I shall leave that for you to decide. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Now, I have noticed that there is much argument about which is more important. Not always out loud type argument, but argument, much contention over which is more important, the stuff or the self. Well, I've seen in writing, and I quote, the one who dies with the most stuff wins. <laughs> now that is distressing. Distressing indeed. Ah, but it gets worse. There is 
<clears throat> there is a... Um, also a tendency to mistake the stuff for the substance of the self. Now, what I mean by that is recently I came upon a facility, a self-storage facility with the name Life Storage. Now that says in one word everything I have said up to this point. Now, their advertisement of supplies the fait accompli, the final word, beyond which no words are necessary. And I quote, it's your life, store it with care. <laughs> Now, indeed, there is not another word worthy of saying at this point in time. Before we go on, I, I would like to clear up a misapprehension. There is a rumor going about that I cannot quit smoking. Why? That's a vicious and pernicious lie. Did anyone here, may I ask, have ever attempted to give up smoking? Anyone here ever attempted? Oh, very, an honest person in the crowd. <laughs> very good. And, and then we know that it's the easiest thing in the world. And I know because I've done it thousands of times. <laughs> Only to succumb again and again to the deliciousness of another fine cigar. Oh, but that's a lie. <laughs> The cigars I fancy are so cheap and rough that I quite frequently find them discarded, unsmoked, along the drive in the wake of recently departed guests. <laughs> so, however, you know that smoking is indeed a bad habit. And if one sincerely and seriously intends to break a bad habit, there is but one strategy that will work, and that is total abstinence. Why? Total abstinence is so excellent a thing that it cannot be carried to too great an extent. In my passion for it, I carry it so far as to totally abstain from total abstinence itself. <laughs> I have made one exception. I used to tell lies, but I've given it up. The field is overrun with amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> then there is a necessity of all of us to set a good example. That is especially incumbent upon those who are in the public eye, such as myself and particularly upon me since the appearance of my autobiography. However, few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. <laughs> As an example of some, and not that I care for moderation myself, I made it a rule never to smoke when I sleep. <laughs> never to refrain from smoking when awake. <laughs> Furthermore, I have a rule never to smoke more than one cigar at a time. <laughs> I, your response reminds me of a truism. Humor is mankind's greatest blessing. A great sense of humor is essential for every successful life. Eh, a mediocre one is helpful. Uh, any sense of humor at all beats none at all. I can tell by your responses there are those here who meet and fit into each of those three categories. <laughs> those most successful among you Laugh with heartiest laughter at my every quip. <laughs> and 
ask to the rest of you. <clears throat> well, you do indeed have my sincerest sympathy. <laughs> as to having a great sense of humor, may I present myself as an example? Yes, Professor Powell, may I present myself as an example. Since my appearance in the 21st century, I have been quite frequently mistaken for the Colonel. <laughs> Sanders, that is, <laughs> of Kentucky Fried Chicken fame. There, there are many people who think I should be affronted and offended by this mistaken identification. However, I find it quite reassuring to be reminded of the Colonel because I remember that he amassed his great fortune only subsequent to the age of 65. That tells me there's per perhaps yet time for me. <laughs> now, in my quest to earn millionaire status, I, I invested heavily in an automated typesetting machine, mm -hmm. believing correctly that such a machine would revolutionize the printing industry. I believe further that through the sale of such machine, I and the increased number of books that could be printed at a higher profit margin, I would make my million. Now, you've all heard of the linotype machine, have you not? It was only recently supplanted by computerization. Unfortunately, I did not invest in the linotype machine. <laughs> Sadly enough, the machine that struck my fancy was the so-called James W. Page Automated Compositor Typesetting Machine. With a name like that, it's no wonder it weighed over four tons. <laughs> well, I sank a fortune into that financial abyss. And in, in, in so, so much as a quarter of a million dollars, and that's a neighborhood that you would want to aspire to live in at that rate, wherever, wherever, and in whatever time it happens to be. However, reckoned in our, or your, Virtually worthless money these days, it amounts to $7.5 million. Now that venture, and the, my venture into conventional publishing with the Charles W. Webster Company, drove me so thoroughly into insolvency that I had to go on tour like some kind of rock star. However, I must say to you, that machine had 18,000 moving parts. It was a thing of beauty, a true work of art. But the dang thing never worked. <laughs> At the end of 1894, I owed the enormous sum of $80,000. I reckoned in this money, $2.4 million, and my creditors would not rest until I should relinquish to them my copyrights. And through that vice and help of my friend Henry Huddleston Rogers, I relinquished them temporarily instead to my wife Libby until I should be able to pay my debt. I completed my Grand World Tour in three years in 1898, having visited 71 cities and regaled 122 audiences. The proceeds from those, uh, from those uh, speeches, shall we say, and from the book that I wrote about it entitled Following the Equator, 
did that in the following two years. In five years, I was able to repay my debt with a tiny little profit of $35,000. I have no idea what I did with the money. Now, I have heard tell that I have been called the world's first rock star. Well, those adventures, no doubt, would account for that accusation. Now, all things considered, looking back on it all, I believe, and I state as modestly as I can, if I have a legacy, is in terms of real wealth, which cannot be expressed in terms of money, property, prestige, or material things, but in things, in riches of the mind and the spirit, as a cultural rock star, as a satirist and literary innovator, as an opinion maker. I could go on, but I wish to sum that up in, by reading to you at least an excerpt from the press release we gave as we ventured onto our Grand World Tour. I think it, it speaks to the way that I have tended to live my life. I, may, I, may I read it to you? This time I wait for an answer. Thank you. This is uh, from, uh, from the Payne biography, by the way. It was a nice young man following me around for years writing about me. And I uh, understand it's a pretty good book. It has been reported that I sacrificed for the benefit of the creditors the property of the publishing firm, Charles W. Webster, whose financial backer I was, and that I am now lecturing for my own benefit. This is an error. I intend the lectures as well as the property for the creditors. The law recommends no mortgage on a man's brain. And a merchant who has given up all he has may take advantage of the laws of insolvency and start free again for himself. But I am not a businessman. And honor is a harder master than the law. It cannot compromise for less than 100 cents on the dollar. Now, in closing, I would like to leave you with two sincere and, and useful thoughts. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Number two, always do right. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. <laughs> now, finally, in closing, I close with this. It's my sure method of living a successful life. Because life is short, Forgive quickly, break the rules, kiss slowly, love truly, laugh uncontrollably, and never regret anything that made you smile. For in 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did. So. Cast off the bow lines, sail away from safe harbors, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Why? Be yourself if you dare. I thank you for your kind attention.